representing an amazing crew at Enfor. A bunch of uh, really, really committed, amazing people who are, we call them low carbon warriors. So what I want to talk to, to you about today is we love Passive House, by the way. We've designed several, but even when we're designing any of our buildings, we use Passive House principles. And those principles guide us to a few co-benefits. Uh, Passive House is generally seen as an energy standard, a very strict energy standard, and, and I understand that and I respect that. But there's wonderful co-benefits, durability, um, comfort, and improved air quality. And that's what I want to talk about today. We're going to showcase just three um, deep energy retrofits, um, legacy MIRBs, and uh, how we use um, Passive House to guide us. Our dynamic city, um, ever-evolving. This photo, of course, is already out of date, and that's a little bit of the point. It's growing um, steadily. As architects, I'm, I'm an architect, we tend to focus on new buildings, and I want to talk today about um, the opportunity of deep energy retrofits. So, the city is growing, but we also have, for example, we're working with amazing clients at Toronto Community Housing, they have like over a thousand buildings that are 40, 50, and 60 years old that now need serious attention. So we see in our, in our research, we, um, high performance buildings, over 50% of their total life cycle carbon is associated with their structure. So if we can renovate buildings, maintain uh, that structure, we are preventing huge amounts of atmospheric carbon. And so th this is the point. Secondary to that, we can make existing buildings passive house performance. I think everybody mm -hmm. understands and believes this. Getting back to this, this idea of the culture, on the right hand side, we have a hot plate and a, and a glass. Um, mm -hmm you know, a coffee maker here. It uses active energy to, to produce comfort. That's, that's the culture that, we've, that we, um, we inhabit. Um, Passo says that you can design a wonderful carafe that doesn't use active energy and it still keeps the coffee hot. And um, Passo teaches us how to do it. Again, I think this is probably more for my own benefit, but we, we like to go back to principles. So there's lots of latent heat out there. We produce a lot of heat. I certainly do because I talk a lot. But people produce heat, appliances, um, equipments of all sorts. If you design your windows properly and Passive House teaches you how to do that, you can let in more heat than the window lets out. So we put a sweater on the building. And we'll start with the thermal insulation. Put, put a blanket around the building retain that heat, conserve the heat, because it's there, no problem. Put in the highest quality windows you can afford. Passive House does a, an amazing job in pre-certifying the performance of windows. What we're talking about here is effective performance. There's a lot of nominal literature out there saying that, you know, this insulation does this, this product does that. Those are nominal values, but when you put them together, lots of unexpected heat flow, paths of heat, um, occur and we need to be aware of that. So we're talking about effective performance here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ventilation here because that's the kind of point of the talk. I'm going to go to air tightness. We, we make our buildings very airtight because a lot of energy can flow across the building enclosure. That's not just an energy issue, that's also a health and safety issue. We can um, you know, produce condensation in our cavities. That can, um, that can be a health issue with mold, etc. Um, this is an important one, and I think Passive House has a, helps us very, very much understand, and our research shows this, and I think there's a lot of research out there, a lot of literature out there that says up to 70% of the heat that you put into your building can be evacuated through unconsidered connections. So it really invalidates the high-performance insulation and windows that you spend all that money on. It undermines their performance. So it's super, super important. We found actually it's a little more important for us to manage our connections than it is the specification of the insulations. We can actually narrow down the insulations if they're properly detailed. Now, getting back to ventilation. Passive House has a very strict uh, definition of what good ventilation means, and I appreciate that. By doing these other, by following these other principles effectively, 
we're now allowed to put in the low-powered, high-performance ventilation into our buildings. We don't have the drafts, we don't have the, the holes in our enclosure that move air around unintentionally, so we can use um, displacement ventilation, we can use dedicated outdoor air systems, even entrainment systems, the mixing of the air happens more consistently because our mean radiant temperature is more consistent. All these co-benefits happen. So I just want to go through um, three buildings and just to respect all the stakeholders, we're just identifying them as A, B, and C. These are um, MERBs, um, Toronto Community Housing uh, Buildings. And uh, we're just going to kind of go through the situation, talk a little bit about what, how we've used Passivos to um, decentralize the ventilation. We know that many MERBs, many, many MERBs are designed with central ventilation. They use a system where they pressurize their corridors, and it's expected that the ventilation air gets from the corridor into the unit. Maybe it's assisted by some um, ventilation, some ki uh, kitchen ventilation, some washroom ventilation. But um, that often doesn't, doesn't happen it, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, MERBs tend to be, we're going to go from kind of short to tall here, but um, they tend to be high rise. So there's a stack effect. And because the buildings weren't designed with passive house principles, they're extremely leaky. Um, the, the stack effect is uh, um, exacerbated. So the ventilation systems are sort of designed with a certain assumption of air tightness that isn't occurring. And the air just is not getting to the units. Also, for a whole variety of, I would submit, reasonable reasons, the um, tenants are sealing their doors because of noise and because of orders. And so that is an effective down to the ventilation. So we're seeing the ventilation is not occurring. We're measuring uh, indoor air uh, quality and we're not seeing the, um, we're seeing very high levels of CO2 um, and other contaminants. So um, this is a, uh, a Jerome Markson building, actually, quite a lovely building, built in the early 80s. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we, surveyed the, we surveyed the interiors. This, this building, it was um, powered by a PTAC unit system, so a, a decentralized um, heat pump. Unfortunately, um, not very effective. The enclosure is extremely low powered. I like to call enclosures high powered or low powered because we like to design high-powered enclosures and low-powered HVAC. That's the passive house way. So a very huge heat flux across the enclosure, lots of discomfort. So um, at Inform, it's very, very important for us. We really rely on energy simulation to try and integrate all the components because I think it's easy to separate them, say, just put lots of insulation, put great windows, and all, and all those other things. Um, but when we're working with big projects with challenging budgets, we want to see the interaction of all the components. So we work with our engineering partners at uh, Morrison Hirschfield here and we develop a map of inputs and outputs. So, you know, um, envelope performance, mechanical performance, window performance, ventilation performance, and we try to optimize a path through all these options to get where, uh, where we want to go. Where we want to go is low EUI um, and low greenhouse gas intensity. So we try to use this map to, to optimize our deployment of uh, 10 minutes, thank you. So um, this is the enclosure. So because of its technology, it was a, um, a mega brick, sort of a jumbo brick uh, veneer with a steel stud backup system. A system that's um, it's been proven to, or, or pr it's prone to, to, to some failures. Unfortunately, we've um, had to review, remove all the uh, masonry, so we're replacing it with a, a high performance, complete, con consistent blanket of insulation and a rain screen um, cladding system. And because of that, because we've stabilized the interior environment, I think that's again the point um, Passivo says, stabilize the interior environment and then you can control the loads. You control the loads, then you can design very high performance, low intensity HVAC systems. And because of that, we've been able to now, we're powering this uh, a system with a decentralized VRF heat pump and we're running the um, refrigerant pipes down within the new cladding system and they pop into the units. And, and we're uh, now decentralizing the ventilation. So we're actually sealing the doors and um, each unit has demand operated uh, ventilation. This is, this is the test suite that we are uh, working out. And I think it was really intelligent. Toronto Community Housing said, okay, we have one vacant unit. Let's get uh, installation in there and, 
um, work with the manufacturers to, to optimize the installation. So our solution, um, we're starting to approach you know, Teddy of 35 now, and we hope it's a, a very elegant and, and respectful um, you know, reinvigoration of that property. The next situation is a, 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 like Twin Towers downtown, um, face sealed EFIS on steel stud, uh, a Teddy of 90. Again, we, we do a survey of the, uh, we call it the situation. So um, there's some, a, a lot of heat transfer through the enclosure, and that's leading to uh, moisture problems. Lots of them, lots of condensation. We run an energy simulation map. So here what we want to do is, because it's high rise, it's a bigger project, we're actually modeling several thicknesses of thermal insulation, um, various types of windows, including passive house certified windows, to see the impact. Here we want to, we're, we're interested in, in, in total life cycle carbon, so we don't want to put more material in the building if we don't have to. And then we're running it, we're, we're, we're measuring the total energy use intensity, the Teddy. Um, in this case, we were worried about cooling, so we're also running SETI, the cooling energy intensity. Green, greenhouse gas intensity, you can see there's a whole bunch here, well below five, which I love to see. TDS, old TDS, tier four, less than five kilos of carbon per square meter. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm after, low carbon, right there, low carbon. That's, that's very low carbon. So um, we're doing a similar, a similar system, so that the, the, the ex existing system has to be removed. It's, it's um, not tenable, so we're replacing it with a complete thermal blanket here um, of about effective R25. That's what we've come down to. And right now we're modeling whether we do um, insulated glazing or triple glazing. It's, it's, on, it's, on, the, it's on the border. And because of that, um, so it's a very similar system, so we're, we're actually uh, swapping out the mechanical for a decentralized uh, VRF system. We're putting the condensers on the roof, running the refrigerant piping down the new enclosure, and it's popping into uh, the units, and we're doing the same thing. We're sealing the doors, downsizing the central fan, and then doing ERVs in, in every suite. So the indoor quality, indoor air quality will be uh, very, very high. So our solution, Teddy of 28. So we're, we're getting close. Right, Enerfit is 25, we're getting close. Um, the last one I wanted to talk about, this is um, um, a little bit of, it's one building, a little bit bigger. This one is, um, um, it prioritizes elder care. So we did thermographs of the uh, existing enclosure, lots of heat flow, lots. So uh, I'm like, this is wonderful, uh, thank you. This is wonderful. Uh, that means that my low teddy approach, my passive hose approach, is going to be extremely effective. So again, lots of enclosure analysis. We use all sorts of tools. Um, even though we rely heavily on energy simulation, usually Energy Plus, we also use things like the uh, uh, Morrison Hirschfield issues a um, building connectivity guide. It's free. It was uh, funded by BC Housing. And um, it's amazing. So what you do is you, you try to design uh, your enclosure system, and then you find a very similar um, version of it in the guide, and they do three-dimensional thermal modeling to give you a very, very accurate estimation of what the con connectivity is. And we use that as a, an early, quote-unquote, sort of simulation tool. It's very, very effective. We love it. Um, we also do, th uh, this, this building has balconies. We might be aware that balconies conduct quite a bit of heat up to 15%, maybe more, of a total uh, building, um, uh, of the total amount of, of heat required for a building. The reason why this is important to me is because I really want to downsize the mechanical system. So if I'm losing heat without being aware of it, it's going to be hard for me to put a heat pump into the building. Heat pumps are more expensive. I understand that they're more sophisticated, but if you put in a really small heat pump, then your client can afford it. So I'm, we're very, very aware of the heat. So we've looked at uh, the effective performance of the enclosure, including balconies. We've, uh, again, developed a map. We, in this case, we, we looked at a whole variety of, um, of active systems. We, we did uh, sort of a one-for-one. One. This was a combined heating system and domestic hot water system, so we did a, a condensing boiler version. Natural gas in our office is a bad word, so I can say it here because I'm not in the office. 
but we kind of show that's a one for one. So what, this is what we do. We show in our buildings by using passive house principles, we prove that putting in a heat pump, you'll use less cost in electricity than you would use in a similarly sized natural gas furnace. That's when clients go, okay, I'm there. Because what they don't want to be told is do the right thing and I have to pay more in electricity. So we really, really focus on designing heat pumps that are small enough that when they put them in, they will spend less on utilities. Anyway, here's the map. We, uh, we try to find the um, path through them. I do, I do want to draw your attention to greenhouse gas intensity. Five, oh yeah, there it is. That's what I'm after, low carbon. And then um, now, because the interior is stabilized, we're able to put in high-performance ERV ventilation that's dedicated for that uh, occupant. The door is sealed, it's demand-operated, multi-speed, um, really, really good air quality for that tenant. So, it's a, thank you. And uh, our solution, oh, look at that. It's any of the We're getting there. <laughs> and that's it, so I want to thank you very much.